All right, hello History 365. So today what I want to do is actually do a brisk survey of gun technology um, from where we left off um, in the late 15th century with the development of matchlock guns um, that have all the kind of things we would expect in a gun, a barrel that you look down, a, uh, a trigger that you pull to, to uh, fire the gun, a stock to hold it against your shoulder. Um, uh, and yet, um, if you are carrying a gun into battle, um, there are, is one big thing that makes a matchlock gun extremely clumsy. And that is the fact that the entire time uh, uh, you have to have a burning match, uh, you some kind of wick, usually it's been soaked in potassium nitrate, um, and if it's not burning, you're not ready for combat. Um, so this means that you have to, uh, you know, kind of have a sense of when you think you might be shooting your gun and light your match. Um, if conditions are wet or rainy, this can potentially put the match out. And the entire time that you were expecting uh, to be in, uh, you know, to be able to shoot your gun at least, you have to have this burning match going through um, feet and feet and feet and feet of of match um, as you you know wait. Um, and you know you can even imagine a sentry, uh, say on a wall, um, who has has a burning match and just how much you burn. You know, Getting, getting through the night. Um, so there's many things that are undesirable about a, a matchlock. Um, and so pretty quickly, uh, there are attempts to find a solution, although it, it takes time. Um, one solution is the wheel lock. Um, and the wheel lock is basically, basically the technology that you would find in a Zippo lighter. Um, the, 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 you know, turning the wheel uh, to actually cause the lighter to ignite. What's happening is that steel wheel is, is, as it turns, is striking iron pyrite, and that's causing a cascade of sparks, and those sparks on the lighter ignite the lighter fluid, but the sparks in a wheel lock um, gun would ignite the, the powder charge that ignites the main charge that, that then shoots the bullet out. Um, now, wheel locks uh, have the advantage of being um, uh, uh, much more... Uh, reliable than a, a matchlock, um, and they are they, they start appearing in the 16th century. Um, so uh, we start hearing about them in the early 16th century, um, and uh, they're being used in battle. They're actually starting to be used for assassinations, um, uh, and uh, so they clearly are, are pretty common uh, by uh, the the you know mid 16th century. Um, there's one big problem about wheel locks, though the mechanism. To, uh, that, that actually causes this is actually quite intricate. So that means they're very expensive um, uh, and uh, also um, somewhat uh, 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 delicate. Um, so they, um, you know, wh while they're used, uh, the guns are more expensive. It's therefore harder to mass issue wheel lock firearms. Most, most uh, good kind of Infantry guns are still going to be matchlocks, in, in part just because they're so much easier to produce and distribute widely. Um, so the wheel lock is a solution, but it is an ex and it's an expensive solution, and it's it's a solution that that is not necessarily suited for mass infantry armies. Um, although wheel lock pistols can become very uh, popular with uh, with cavalry, um, and even the the pistol is going to change. Um, uh, cavalry tactics, as cavalry moves away from trying to stab someone with a lance or slash them with a sword. Lances and swords instantly continue to be used uh, uh, into the 19th century. Um, but that being said, uh, people start realizing it's actually much more effective fighting on horseback um, as you are engaging in kind of uh, melee combat um, to shoot someone with a pistol. Um, so the ultimate solution, particularly one that, that gives us uh, 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 kind of the, the, the European musket, um, is uh, going to be the flintlock system. Um, and that is uh, basically a piece of flint um, that uh, strikes down, that when, the, when it's released by the trigger, creating a shower of sparks. Um, a system is created that as the flint strikes, it, it, the, the, the steel piece that it strikes actually opens up the flash pan. Um, so that the sparks then fall down as the, as the flint continues its journey downwards, um, igniting the primer charge, which then can ignite the, uh, the main charge and actually shoot the, the bullet or the ball. Um, now, the flintlock system uh, has the advantage of it's simple. Um, yes, you do have to, to make sure that the flint is properly trimmed, but it is relatively simple. It's relatively easy to maintain. It's relatively robust. 
Um, and also you can, you can use it in a wider variety of environments because the, the pan itself is covered until the flint strikes. Um, uh, it's, it, it offers some, not perfect, protection from rain or uh, wet conditions. Um, and the fact that it's a relatively simple mechanism um, also means that it is much more suited for a kind of rugged combat environment than, say, a, a, a intricate and delicate wheel lock system. So flintlock um, muskets, uh, the, the flintlock is really a 17th century development. Um, and by the time we get towards the, uh, the, the middle of the, of the 17th century, the flintlock system is coming to predominate. Um, now, uh, one advantage as these uh, muskets in some ways become simpler, they take less time to load, um, and this also allows for some changes in infantry tactics. So um, we kind of left off in the pike and shot era, um, where essentially a block of pikemen um, provide close cover for infantry who fight on the wings, usually arrayed in kind of big squares or, or deep rectangles. Um, and that is simply to facilitate the slow pace of loading, um, uh, particularly a big, big clumsy uh, matchlock rifle. Um, so the soldiers can go in the front, shoot, go to the back. Um, by the time they get to the middle of the 17th century, um, and, and these tactics are actually closely associated with Gustav Adolphus in the Thirty Years' War, a, a, the Swedish king who uh, intervenes on behalf of the Protestants in the Thirty Years' War, a war fought between um, Protestant and Catholic factions within the Holy Roman Empire, um, the Gustav Adolphus starts to array his muskets in, in a much thinner line, um, uh, anywhere from three to six ranks. Um, uh, and indeed, the, the trend in European infantry tactics is going to be thinner and thinner until the British, by the say the time of the Revolutionary War, have it down to two, two, um, two ranks of musketeers. Um, and in order to, to, to thin the ranks, essentially you have to have weapons that can be reloaded quite quickly um, so that the ranks can fire um, and yet can keep up a rate of fire um, without um, uh, you know, simply running out of time to reload. Um, so uh, that, that is going to be kind of the, the last big trend in infantry tactics is the trend towards uh, 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 line, uh, you know, thinner lines of infantry and formations that are basically rectangular rather than being squares. Um, now, as muskets uh, achieve a faster rate of fire, both through a combination of improved technology and also improved training and drill, um, this means that you need fewer and fewer pikemen. The, the muskets are better able to hold their own um, without necessarily feeling that at any given moment they need to retreat behind a bristle of pikes. Um, now, that said, um, for the pike to truly go away, you need to have a musketeer be able to um, fight hand-to-hand -hand effectively in the event that um, uh, he comes to close combat in between um, shots, um, which is an obviously not unlikely possibility when you have you know, even, a, even a musket with a well-trained soldier um, operating in kind of drill conditions could, could still easily take 20 or 30 seconds to load a smooth bore musket. Um, so one solution people hit on pretty nicely is, uh, you know, uh, what if we could turn the musket into a spear? Um, now, again, from a pretty early point, people learn how to club a musket, which is just turn it over and start using the stock as a club. And, and that will, that will be a feature of, uh, a combat with long, uh, guns, well, uh, up until the present to a degree. Um, but, um, wouldn't it be nice if you actually could, you know, rather than having to have a musket, uh, you know, a group of, of soldiers armed with muskets fighting alongside men armed with pikes, wouldn't it be nice if the musket could turn into a pike, um, a bayonet? Um, now, the first bayonets were plug bayonets. So essentially, they, the way that the uh, musket turns into spear was taking a bayonet, and the bayonet has a plug that simply fits into the barrel, um, like a huge cork, essentially. Um, now, uh, this... Um, uh, has a real disadvantage, right? In that um, it means that if a soldier is uh, feels like they need to fix bayonets, um, they can now no longer actually use the gun as a gun until they take the bayonet out, and then they can begin to reload. 
Um, uh, and uh, it, it also means that um, if you are, uh, if you wish to say fire your, your your musket and then attack someone with a bayonet, you have to fire the musket, then take the bayonet, then put it on. Um, wouldn't it be nice if the bayonet could be actually permanently attached? Um, now, plug bayonets um, are are pretty common throughout the 17th century. Um, the socket bayonet um, is kind of developed in the late 17th century and then becomes ubiquitous in the early 18th century. And the socket bayonet is actually what we think of as kind of a classic bayonet. It's a bayonet that, rather than plugging into the barrel, has a little loop that fits around the barrel and then has a, has a little socket that can lock on to a, um, a you know, kind of a little nub, a, 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 locking, a lock, I guess, on the end of the barrel, um, and that holds it. Um, and so this has many advantages. One, you can keep the bayonet fixed during the entire battle. Um, yes, the bayonet is, makes the musket a little clumsier, um, but uh, at, the fact that you can have it attached means that you can uh, operate the musket as a musket. Um, it means that you can fire a volley and then immediately charge into the enemy after that's, that's, that's just felt the effects of the volley. So um, it, it allows actually for bayonets to be seamlessly incorporated into um, uh, the uh, sort of battle rhythm of, of musket volleys. Um, uh, and uh, it basically, um, even though pikes had been diminishing, um, the the rise of the bayonet, first with the plug bayonet, and then finally with the socket bayonet, means we, we don't need non-musket infantry anymore. So it allows us to have infantry that is uniformly um, armed with muskets. Yes, there's, there's some specialized um, uh, types of infantry units, um, such as uh, dragoons who are, are mounted infantry, um, uh, and grenadiers who, who carry muskets, but also actually throw kind of crude hand grenades that you light the fuse. But for the most part, um, we see the, the musket the musket and bayonet is now the dominant infantry weapon. Um, and therefore, we, we have infantry lines rather than these kind of blocks, alternating blocks of pikemen and, uh, and, and musketeers. So those are our, so, so that, you know, that is, a, is sort of our series of uh, kind of final developments that brings the musket up into the um, place where it's at in the 18th century and really into the Napoleonic Wars. We have flintlock muskets being the operating system. We have socket bayonets, um, um, by the, which are getting ubiquitous by the early 18th century. Um, and that gives us the kind of infantry tactics um, that we might associate with the American Revolution, the wars of the French Revolution, and even the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so that's going to be kind of our last bit on technical developments. Um, we, what I might do is talk a little bit about um, sort of some of the wars of the 17th and 18th century next time. Um, and again, I probably our last lecture on Monday will consider when should the course end? Um, what are the big discontinuities in, mili in the military history of Western Eurasia? that would divide the entire phenomenon of war and culture in Europe into two easy parts. So we'll talk soon.